In this video, we're going to be starting the process of setting up memory management inside of our operating system, specifically taking a look at the idea of paging. The first thing that we have to do with this setup of memory management is that we actually have to have a map of what memory looks like in our system. And in order to get that, we need to be able to retrieve that information from the BIOS. So in the case of working with Grub2 or Multiboot, as we're doing right now, it's actually a pretty easy process to retrieve this information. Basically, inside of the multi-boot header, there is this flags word, and we can set different bits to get different pieces of information. Specifically, the ones of interest to us is bit one, which will give us all of the available memory information, and then bit two, which would give us information about the video mode table, which we won't need yet, but sometime down the line, we might need that as well. So this information is actually retrieved by multi-boot or grub2. And then we could set it over to our kernel for it to be able to use. If we're not using grub2, we would actually have to do this through BIOS uh, system calls, right? We could use interrupts to be able to retrieve this information. But because it's integrated into grub2, we don't need to worry about that process. It helps simplify everything for us. Now to see the format of this, we can go into the boot information format in the grub specification, and it will show us information about that format. And where we would find that easiest is in this example OS code here. We have this multiboot.h, which shows us a header file that will outline all of the different structs related to the data that is retrieved from the grub2 bootloader over to our kernel. So we could see that there's a variety of different pieces of information, and we'll discuss how we can use some of this information to do our memory mapping and management. So first off, let's get this all set up. So inside of my boot.s file, I do have this second field here, which is the flags field which I've set to the value of three. The value of three would mean that bits one and two are set, which would give us the memory information as well as the video information. So those two pieces will be retrieved for us. The main things to keep in mind is that these two values have to match, right? The checksum value and the actual flag value here. So just make sure those two match and you'll be good to go. Now to actually send this data over, we need to know where that data is going to be located. And if you take a look at the specification, it will give you some information about where that data is actually located. The location of that data is going to be placed onto one of our registers, right? So I think that we can generally find this inside of, and if you scroll down a little bit further here, actually you'll see a sample of boot.s and you can see that information as well. So you'll see here, as you come down, you see that it pushes EBX and EAX. This is the multi-boot information structure, is that EBX? And then EAX is the magic value. So typically we push these two values to be able to use them inside of our kernel. So to do that, we simply just do a push EBX and push EAX, which I've got right here, right? So we do that right before we call the kmain function, and that will place that into our kernel for it to be able to use. Now over inside of our kernel, we're of course going to adjust this so that this function now takes in some arguments. The arguments that it's going to take in is a uint32 for the value magic, and as well a struct multi boot info, I'll call it, which is going to be called boot info. And of course, we'll modify the signature here as well so that it matches exactly. Now we actually have to implement this struct for multi-boot info. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a file for that. I'm gonna call it multi-boot.h. And inside of this file, I'm going to implement the different structs that I actually require. Now, the structs that I'm implementing are available inside of that, uh, that sample header file, right? This sample header file here has everything that I'm going to implement in this video. However, I'm going to make some small changes because we're working in 32-bit mode and this is set up for 64-bit. So there will be some small changes, but generally you can use this as a reference or you can use the, the code that I'll place in the description and that'll be a good reference for you as well. So we come over here, there's a few different structs that we're gonna define. The first two structs are these two, the A out simple table and the elf section header table. And as well on this section here, we can actually see information about each of these different structs to be able to better understand exactly what they represent, right? So we have the symbol table for A dot out, and then we have the section header table for elf. Those are those two structs, right? So basically they're just representing different informations about our executables. We can see things like, a, you know, tab size, string size, uh, address, we have a reserve section, th these types of pieces of information, right? So these we're not too concerned about quite yet. The main thing that we're actually concerned about is our multi-boot info struct. And I'll just go ahead and copy it over and then we can talk a little bit about that. 
So here we have our multi-boot info struct, and it has a lot of information about just general things that are retrieved from that multi-boot uh, setup, right? So you have things like flags that are set, uh, memory lower and upper bounds. You see that these are divided up into two 32-bit values rather than one 64-bit. That will be a common thing that you'll see in 32-bit based structures, and you'll, you've seen that in previous videos as well, right? We have a union inside of here, and if you haven't seen a union before, basically it's a way of being able to include these structs within this struct here. So that's generally what this union is allowing us to do is to have these structs available inside of this outer struct as well. So that's something you may not have seen before. And that's generally all this is really doing is just including these structs. We have information about the MMAP length, the address, the drive information. We have information about the bootloader, the APM, and then we have some video control values. And like I mentioned before, and I'll, I'll keep mentioning this, you can see a breakdown of each of these with these comments. So basically we have different things like you know, kernel command line, the root partition, memory mapping buffer. A lot of these pieces of information we're going to use throughout the development of our operating system. And a few of them will be useful now for just setting up things like memory mapping. Now there's one more struct that we need. And this one is the main struct that actually has to change for our 32-bit mode. That struct is the multi-boot mmap entry. And what I want to call your attention to compared to the header that's shown on Grub is these two fields here. If we take a look at grub on this mmap entry, what you're going to see is that these are set to 64-bit values. Because we're in 32-bit mode, we actually have to split these between two different values. We have the address low, address high, length low, length high. You have to make sure to do this, otherwise things will get skewed and it won't align correctly. So I ran into this problem where I was trying to retrieve the type and the type would always be zero because I had these as 64-bit values. So it's something to be very careful of in this setup is that it will skew that struct if these aren't divided up into 32-bit values. Now we have a few constants that are defined inside of here as well. These constants are allowing us to see information about the memory. So basically, when we take a look at memory, we're gonna see a few different categories of it. The main ones are gonna be available versus reserved. Available means that we could use that memory for mapping. Reserved means that the memory is reserved for something else and we generally shouldn't use it for mapping. So that's something that's gonna be very important for us later down the road. So with this multi-boot setup, what we can do is we can see a bit of information about this multi-boot info. It's very interesting to see how this is generally structured before we start to work with it. So I just want to give you that intuition first, and then we can move on into actually setting up our memory management. So I'm going to create a memory.c file, and I will accompany it with a memory.h file. And inside of memory.h, I'm going to define the one function that I'm going to set up here. I'm going to call it init memory. And it's going to take in a struct of multi-boot info, which is that, that boot info that we got from the kernel. Now, before I move on here, one thing that I'm just going to put in here is just that include multi-boot.h, just to make sure I don't forget that. So from here, what we're going to do is we're going to call that init memory, and we're going to call it with boot info. That's going to come over to memory.c, which is going to contain the code for that function. So let's talk a little bit about this code. I'm going to include a few different things here. I'm gonna need my standard int in order to have my types available to me. I'm gonna need multiboot.h to have access to that struct, the boot info one. And then I'm also just going to include my standard lib in order to be able to print things out onto the screen. So in it memory, we're gonna set up as a void function since it won't return anything. And it takes in a struct multi-boot info, which I'll call boot info. Now, what we want to do is we want to loop through or iterate through the actual mapping in order to see information about it. The way that we do this is pretty interesting. It actually requires us to be able to dereference addresses that are coming from these structures. So basically inside of the multiboot.h, we have a few different values that are uint32s, right? A lot of these uint32s are addresses that point to the actual information itself. So we have to dereference those addresses and be able to retrieve that data. You'll see how we do that here. So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna say for uh, int i equals zero, I'm gonna iterate through until i is no longer less than the value of boot info mmap length. So the mmap length tells us the length of the memory map that is available inside of boot info. 
So that's why we're iterating to that. And each time we're going to increase by the size of the struct multi boot mmap entry. And don't worry, I'll wrap the text here so you can see that whole line. So this struct here is this right here. This represents a single memory map entry. So the memory map entry is going to tell me the size of the memory location, the address of it, the length of it. It's going to tell me information about the type of it. Is it reserved? Is it available? We'll see that. I'll print those all out to the screen for us to see. So basically, we're going to have a whole bunch of these entries available. And all of these entries combined together in size is equal to that mmap length property. So that's the way that this iteration is generally working. Now from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a struct for multi-boot mmap entry, and I'm just going to call it mmmt like this. And what it's going to be equal to is a struct multi-boot mmap entry star to boot info and then mmap address plus i. Let me explain this. So mmap address is a address of a single multi-boot mmap entry struct. So what happens is we get the address and then we parse it as a multi-boot mmap entry struct. So basically what's gonna happen is C is going to go to that location and it's gonna retrieve that structure and place it into the struct that we're defining here. Now this plus i is generally going to work because each of the mmap addresses are offsetted by that value i, right? So if I add i to it, it will take me to the current mmap struct that I'm at. So this will start at zero. The next time it adds the size of this struct, so it would move to the next available struct in memory. And it continues through that process until we have reached this mmap length, meaning that there's nothing left for us to look at anymore. And the result of this is that we get a nice looking struct that we can actually look at and see what values we get. So let me show you. So we're just gonna print out each of the different values. I'm gonna show you the low address. I'm gonna show you the high address. Where percent %x is just hex values, right? So because we're working with memory addresses, it's best to look at those using the percent %x. It just is you know, the, the most ideal format for that. We have a size, which is percent %x, and we have a type. The type is percent %d. It's a, an integer value, right? And the type actually maps based on that header, right? I don't know if I mentioned that, but it maps based on the uh, these constants here. So it's the integer values here is what we're looking at. So when we go and print this, we're just simply looking at the M M M M MMMT values, right? MMMT address lower or address low. This one is address high. And then we want the length low and then we want the uh, length high. And then we want the size. And then we want the type. Okay. So that gives us all of our different fields. We're just mapping them one to one into each of these different prints, right? With that, we have the simple mapping iteration set up. So let's take a look at this and see how that actually works. So we'll just take a look here. It looks like I've got everything set up for init memory. So init memory should run fine for us. Inside of our make file, we're of course going to include our memory. So I'll just copy this command here. We'll say memory.c over to memory.o, and then I'll link this into my value here. So it will be memory.o like this. There we go. Let's try to actually set this up and see how it works. Just to make sure I'm in the right directory here. Yeah, okay, I think I am. So we'll go through a make, and it looks like it made successfully. And then I'm gonna run my QMU command in order to take a look at my kernel. And there you go. Do you see that we have each of the different values printing out? Now, we can take a look at this and read it and understand you know, how the memory is actually being mapped. We can see this general growth between the different memory addresses. So the lowest one is going to start at zero and then it'll have a specified length to it. The next one generally starts at the next length. So you see it's like low address plus low length brings us up to this next address here. 
right? And we can see that pattern continuing on as we're continuing through here, right? As we bounce on through. And eventually we get to the very top of memory, which is going to be, you know, in the high F values, right? So you can see generally how each of these is broken down. Now, each of these has a type associated with them, as we discussed. When we take a look at our types, we can then decode what memory is actually available, what memory is not. So we have one for memory available, everything else is not available. And generally we'll see that, you know, this one at the low end is available for us. These ones are twos, which means that they're already reserved. This one is available for us. This is a large set of memory, which is great. And then the twos here are not available for us. So we do have a lot of memory available for us to use in our operating system. So from here, what we could do is we could take a look and just simply say, well, if the type equals one, then I can take this memory and I can start to build pages out of it to be able to use for things like processes and this type of idea. And that's generally what we're gonna to continue to look at as we're building up this idea of memory management. So what we'll do is we'll end off here. This gives you a bit of an insight towards how we retrieve those memory structures and what we can generally do with them. The next video, we're going to actually apply this to start to build up our memory management setup. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.